So very, very fortunate, of course, to have Dr. Andres Acosta with us here today. He trained as a GI fellow here at Mayo and did a postdoctoral research fellowship here. And now he's an assistant professor in the Department of Gastroenterology. Um, like we were talking about his research and clinical interests over the years have focused on obesity medicine, in particular, an individualized approach to obesity management. Um, he's been extremely prolific, uh, driving scholarship in this area. Um, he's also the founder and CEO of Phenomic Sciences, a, a company that uses a blood test to identify obesity subtype and guide the most effective management. So all very exciting work in the forefront of obesity management, um, which is so relevant to so many of our patients. So thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Acosta. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Karina. A, a real pleasure to uh, come and, and uh, share our work with all of you. Um, uh, I have to say that it's, it's an honor uh, to reconnect back with Karina. We were, uh, she was one of my, the first residents in the team that I joined as a fellow. So we start working there together. And now, um, so it's great to reconnect now and come back and give a talk. But the, the main reason why I'm here is because of the work that we're doing with uh, Don Hensrud, who told me he couldn't join us today. But together with Don and the Healthy Living Program, for those of you who uh, either send your patients or, or, or actually are practicing in the Healthy Living Program, uh, we're trying to merge our efforts uh, that we were doing in, in the research sphere with what Don and the Healthy Living Program have done to help our patients. So um, most of you have your clinics flooded with patients with obesity. And uh, my, my hope is that after my talk, I can share some of my vision and the data that we're driving uh, to help patients with obesity and produce a change in the management by bringing new tools to our practice. So um, I call this Precision Medicine for Obesity and I wanna show some new tools to enhance medical weight loss. Um, and then I know many of you might be, uh, have to leave early or have to be called page out to see patients. So in the case of those of you who leave early, I like to start with a key takeaway. And in, in a brief summary, what I'm going to cover today is that the one treatment fits all is not working. Obesity is a complex disease with many different phenotypes. And phenotype-guided interventions doubles the amount of weight loss, and hopefully obesity will be measured with a simple blood test in the near future. As Karina mentioned, I do have some disclosures that I like to share. Uh, I'm the uh, founder of uh, Gila Therapeutics, and I'm also the founder of uh, Phenomic Sciences. Phenomic Sciences is a Mayo Clinic spin-out company, and I'm going to be showing data that is relevant to this company. I also do consulting work from some other companies, and I receive funding from the NIH as well as from industry which will be described today. So what I wanna to cover today at Learning Objectives, I wanna make an introduction briefly to obesity and other obesity classifications, describe about the heterogeneity of obesity phenotypes, talk about the obesity actionable phenotypes classification, then introduce the characteristics of these obesity phenotypes and why they're unique, talk about phenotypes guided weight loss, and then briefly describe about this biomarker that we're working for a phenotype test. So let's get jump into it. So as you all know, obesity is the number one chronic disease in the world. In the United States, 40% of adults are, su are suffering from obesity. And this number is concerning is going to grow to about 50% by the end of this decade. And obesity matters not because we look a little bit heavier or we wanna have lose a few pounds before our, our summer season. It matters because it leads to heart disease, a stroke, type two diabetes and premature death. Basically we're dying from obesity. And before COVID, 19, I used to say that this was the worst pandemic of our history. It might still be, hopefully we'll get over COVID and we go back to focus about obesity. The prevalence of obesity is alarming and is driving death. We're living less because of the prevalence of obesity. And we also are spending $480 billion on direct annual healthcare costs in obesity. And if we add the indirect annual healthcare costs, we're spending $1.4 trillion in obesity or obesity-related diseases. So half of our healthcare budget is spent on obesity-related diseases. And it matters even more is because the existing obesity treatments are mostly ineffective. And yes, there's people who might benefit from one intervention or the other. We have five FDA-approved medications, three to five endoscopic devices, and we have three bariatric surgeries. Every week we have a new diet, and unfortunately our patients are not losing significant amount of weight and keeping it off. 
And the big question is, why is this happening? And I think it's happening because we have a variability in response to treatments. So the one size fits all is really not working. And we keep thinking that this new thing is going to work, this new pill, this new surgery, this new device, or this new diet. But unfortunately, it doesn't work for all. And what I mean it doesn't work for all is when we take that data, for example, in this case, I'm showing the data from uh, Lira Glutide 3 milligrams that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. We can see that despite of being on an FDA phase three clinical trial and patients taking the medication and measuring the concentration of the medication, we get 30% of patients who lose more than 10% of body weight, but then 70% of patients who were taking the medication did not lose weight, did not lose significant amount of weight, actually some of them gained weight. And this is not just unique for this medication. We see the same pill-shaped curve for diets. Here I'm showing an example with low carb, but if you're a fan of low fat, you know, the same thing. Here we have the same thing with this medication, liraglutide, with endoscopic devices, as well as with surgery. So the big question and the big challenge is, how do we identify these patients? How do we identify these patients who will lose significant amount of weight with just with a diet? or with a medication. And at the same time, who are these patients who are not responding to bariatric surgery or to a device when they're spending you know, a lot of money in getting these procedures and associated with significant comorbidities? So who are these patients? How can we find them so we can enhance their weight? And the, one of the problems that we have when we try to select who are the best patients is that the current obesity classifications are focusing mainly on cardiovascular and comorbidities risk, meaning obesity severity, but they're not really focusing on obesity stratification or obesity segmentation. And what I mean by that is when we look at body mass index, are you all familiar? Body mass index with or without waist circumference is telling us who is at a higher risk of having heart disease and dying from your body weight. Newer classifications such as metabolic status of a patient, and here in red, I show the ones who have metabolically abnormal status, Basically, they have a higher BMI, but they also have high insulin resistance, high diabetes, high cardiovascular disease, compared to those who do not have these risk factors, I still don't tell me who should I treat. So if I have a patient in front of me who do not have metabolically abnormal obesity, meaning they don't have diabetes or risk of cardiovascular disease, but they have joint pains and they wanna lose weight, the metabolic status doesn't help me to select what intervention I should do to my patient. And finally, newer staging systems, such as the obesity comorbidity staging system, tell us that obesity should be classified on medical, mental, and functional disorders, and then we should have a stage zero to four. And for example, if we use the fatty liver disease or the liver as this, the stage zero will be there's no fat on the liver. Stage one, there's been a fat in the liver called NAFLD. Stage two, there is NASH. Stage three, there's cirrhosis. And stage four, there's end-stage liver disease secondary to obesity. It still doesn't tell me how can I choose what indication to my patient who needs to lose weight? So because of that, we decided to take a different approach. Instead of focusing on the traditional approach in which diseases are grouped into phenotypes that then we call a disease, we go through any intervention discovery program, we go and do expensive trials, and then we have highly variable outcomes. We decided to use the what we're calling the precision medicine approach, which actually takes a different approach into things. And it's an approach that we have been using in diseases in for many centuries, and we want to bring this back. We look at a disease, we break it into phenotypes, and then each unique phenotype, after doing a stratification of the disease, will have their unique deep phenotype or unique characteristics. We may have multi-omics tests that can help us identify what is that phenotype. We can do companion diagnosis and more uh, targeted treatments, have more focused trials, and then have better outcomes. So we embarked to do this in obesity and as, as the first arm for chronic diseases. But the question when you wanna address heterogeneity in obesity and most chronic diseases is where to start. So because of that, we decided to take an approach and look at phenotypes of obesity. And what is a phenotype? Phenotypes are the interaction of our genetics with our environment. And as we all know, the genetics are coming from mom and dad, and they are telling us how we, we work. But at the same time, when we're exposed to our environment, the combination of these two is to give us as our own unique phenotype. So for example, I can have the worst genetics from mom and dad, and both of them have, have obesity and heart disease and so on. But if I decide to exercise every day, eat extremely healthy, avoid medications that may make me gain weight, non-smoke, have a very healthy microbiome, and so on, I might have a very good phenotype. On the contrary, you know, I might have a perfect genetic background from my mom and dad, 
But if I do the contrary of what I just explained and I don't exercise, I eat very poorly, I take medications that make me gain weight, I smoke and I have a terrible bad microbiome, I might have a poor phenotype. So we decided to look into what are the obesity phenotypes. And if you ask someone, you know, there's very controversial, what is an obesity phenotype? And some people may say that there's like about 280 obesity phenotypes. But we want to simplify it and bring it out to what is the most simplistic way that we could describe this among us physicians in the practice to our patients. So in order to simplify that, we need to say that obesity pathophysiology is a disease of energy balance where intake and expenditure are driving this abnormal energy balance. And intake is driven by our hunger, our satiation or our desire of fullness or when we stop eating because of fullness, our satiety or return to hunger, satiety is for how long we stay feeling full, as well as our emotional eating. And then energy expenditure is driven by uh, our resting energy expenditure, our physical activity, and our exercise. And when we lose this balance between intake and expenditure, we start storing calories in the form of fat. And that fat comes with two problems, a deposit toxicity and a deposit excess. It's the deposit toxicity that drives inflammation, that drives insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and so on. And it's the excess of a deposit that drives joint disease, sleep apnea, depression, GERD, and other things that are associated with excess. So because of these, we wanted to separate the, the, the phenotypes of obesity that are focusing on energy balance versus those from storage that many people have focusing that drives particular to prediabetes as well as metabolic syndrome. So focusing on energy expenditure, we decided to study patients initially in the research unit and then in the clinic and phenotype these patients to try to understand what was a unique phenotype or abnormality. So how our day goes, we actually invite patients to come after an overnight fasting. We do a DEXA scan to measure body composition. Then we do a resting energy expenditure to measure their basic metabolic rate. We provide a standard breakfast, which has some radioisotopes that we can do measure the gastric emptying. And we also measure visual anal scales for measuring appetite, hunger, satiety, satisfaction, and desire to eat. And we measure these things for four hours. Four hours later, we provide an ad libitum buffet meal. And we ask the patients, eat as much as you want. And we, the dietitian, we're tracking how many calories they consume. And then we follow these patients for two hours more to see what's their sensation of fullness. And while all this is going on, we do different questionnaires for emotional eating, three eating factor questionnaires, and hospital and anxiety and depression scale. So that's how a whole day is spent on our patients. And now let me drive you, show you to you why there is such a heterogeneity in obesity. So when we measure the visual scales for hunger in our patients, we can see that patients with obesity, 248 patients, when they come after they have a standard breakfast of 320 calories, four hours later, some of them might not feel hunger at all. Some of them will feel completely hungry, 100% hungry. So we can see that not only there's a heterogeneity on response of obesity, but there's also heterogeneity within each of these unique phenotypes. Same thing with satiation. Satiation we measure by a nutrient ring test in which we tell patients to start consuming calories until they have reached fullness. When we measure 132 patients with normal weight, they ate around 640 calories. When we measure these in patients with obesity, patients with obesity ate around 770 calories. So there's a 130 calorie difference to actually patients with obesity to reach fullness. So next time when you are, have a patient with obesity that says, doc, I don't need that much, you know, we need to think, keep in mind that maybe they don't, maybe they do, but we know that all comers with obesity require 130 more calories before they feel full. The same thing when we reach in maximal fullness, we keep feeding these patients until they have reached maximal fullness, what I like to call Thanksgiving night fullness. And we can see that the difference remains of 125 calories, but in this case, patients who are normal weight ate around 1,200 calories, and those with obesity ate around 1,300 calories. But there's still a huge heterogeneity on food intake, and we can see in 660 patients with obesity, the range goes from about 300 calories to more than 2,000 calories. And when we want to check for maximal fullness, the range goes from 444 calories to 2,800 calories. So even if we have a patient with obesity, we, need, we don't know if the patient with obesity is eating more calories compared to patients who are normal weight. And we can see here the dotted line represents 
you know, mean caloric intake in normal weight controls. So I'm going to keep going with the same examples. Now I'm going to show for gastric emptying. In 2015, we showed that the gastric emptying of patients with obesity is faster. And as you may think, many patients with diabetes have gastroparesis and their gastric emptying is slower. Here, patients with obesity, we show that they have an accelerator or rapid gastric emptying. And the heterogeneity remains the same. Our sensation of fullness two hours after a meal, it varies again from zero to 100. And when we look at the gastric emptying of patients with obesity, we have the same heterogeneity. It varies from 51 minutes to 206 minutes. And then the same thing with, we measure emotional eating with three eating factor questionnaires and anxiety scales. And we can see that patients with obesity, we will look at all comers, have higher levels of anxiety and emotional eating as shown in this a publication here, as well as we show in 2015 that patients with obesity have higher anxiety, but then we still have huge heterogeneity among patients with obesity. Some patients do not have any anxiety. Some patients have almost clinically graded anxiety. And then finally, when we look at the energy expenditure domains, and we look at basic energy expenditure, physical activity, non-physical activity, we report steps and exercise, we see that there's a huge heterogeneity among patients with obesity, and this varies all the way from normal energy expenditure, which will be 100%, and we have patients who are burning about 70% and those who are burning 120%. The daily steps also has a huge variability, going all the way up to 2,500 steps to almost 17,000 steps a day. And the exercise, we have patients who do not exercise at all, and those who exercise will exercise and, and burn about 300 calories when they exercise, and there are patients who are burning more than 2,000 calories when they exercise. So to summarize these, doesn't matter what phenotype we see of obesity, all of them have this huge heterogeneity. And not only we have heterogeneity on the phenotypes, but we also have heterogeneity on response to treatment. So how can we tackle obesity when we know it's such a heterogeneous disease? So in order to do that, we decided to go back and look at uh, patients and actually did something that we physicians have been doing for many years is trying to select an abnormal cutoff. So in order to do this, we say, well, we know the variables that we think matter the most in obesity, food intake and expenditure. We have measured them with validated tests in the clinic as well as in our research unit. And we know that uh, what is the mean and interquartile ranges of these variables. We also know that females and males is one of the most important factors and is essential to separate females and males when we're talking about uh, uh, um, these variables. So what we decided to do is select an a priori cutoff of 75th percentile to define the abnormal cutoff. And it's the same cutoff that's been used for other things. For example, what is the abnormal cutoff for creatinine was also used the 90th percentile to patients with normal creatinine. Here we decided to use the 75th percentiles within obesity as that is closer to two standard deviations or greater. So for patients with uh, uh, abnormal satiation, we define uh, 894 calories to be normal or less for females and 1300 calories and 76 for males. For gastric emptying, we define females to empty their stomach in um, uh, lo uh, lower than 101 minutes or abnormal if you empty your stomach in less than 101 minutes, your T half, or 86 minutes for males. For anxiety it was the same for both genders, seven, and then for predicted RE was 96% for females and 94% for males. So using these cutoffs for abnormal variables, we decided to classify obesity in these four main categories. And then we went and validated these in 450 patients that were participating in our trials at Mayo Clinic. So the first group is a group that has abnormal satiation. And I'll explain through the talk what that means, but basically abnormal satiation, we're starting to call it this hungry brain, because the brain is not getting the sensation of feeling full and we just consume significant amount of calories. The next group we're calling hungry gut. So this is abnormal satiety. The gut is not sending the signals to the brain to tell the brain to stay feeling full. The third group is emotional hunger or people who are eating for their emotions and they're either positive or negative emotions. And the fourth group is those who have abnormal metabolism or they're not eating enough. They're, they're not burning enough calories on their daily metabolism. So using these four obesity groups, we decided to, and selecting a 75th percentile a priori cutoff, we decided to study what will happen, what will be their prevalence and distribution in 450 patients. So all these patients have a BMI greater than 30, their average was 39, their average BMI was 37, 72% of them are females, 93% are white, 
the majority of them have abnormal waist circumference and the, normal, the majority of them have impaired fasting glucose. So when we look at the distributions of these uh, phenotypes on our cohort, using the 75th percentile of abnormal to define these obesity cohorts, we found out that there is what 16% of patients who have this hungry brain or abnormal fullness. But then we saw that there's an overlap of patients having more than one criteria. For example, 8% will have hungry brain and hungry gut. 18% will have only hungry gut. 3% will have hungry gut and emotional hunger. 12% will only have emotional hunger. 2% have a slow burn and emotional hunger with 12% have a slow burn and 5% will have hungry brain and slow burn. 9% have a combination of all of them and then, or, or more than three of them. And then 15% of patients do not meet any of these criteria. So this was very interesting to see what would be the distribution of these variables defining as an abnormal cutoff using the 75th percentile showing that 15% of them will not have no phenotype 27% of them will have two phenotypes or more, and then the remaining will only have one phenotype. So this was very interesting, and we decided to actually dig a little bit farther and see what is unique among these individuals when we look at them compared to other patients with obesity. So we decided to study the characteristics of these obesity phenotypes, and when we look at this classification of obesity and we look them into more details, for example, these patients with hungry brain and we measure their fullness. Again, females and males is the most important variable, so it's essential to separate them. Here in blue, we have the folks who have the abnormal phenotype, and we can see on average, these patients are eating 1,300 calories compared to 700 calories. And we rem if we re remember that I, the data that I just showed in normal weights, these patients with obesity are consuming the same amount of calories that those who are normal weight. And then we have patients with the abnormal phenotype of abnormal satiation, who are eating the, those females more than 1,300 calories before they feel full and male more than 1,600 calories. Same thing with emotional eating. Both females and males have a higher levels of emotional eating, but not all patients with obesity. We have a group, uh, a big group of patients with obesity who do not have this abnormal trait. When we look at the hungry gut or abnormal satiety and we look at gastric emptying, we have females and males who have an accelerated gastric emptying, but the remaining of patients with obesity have a normal gastric emptying and normal satiety. And same thing with energy expenditure, patients with abnormal energy expenditure for both females and males are burning less calories than what is predicted, but then the remaining patients of obesity actually are burning more calories than what they should be burning if we, use, um, uh, if we calculate as 100% of their predicted energy expenditure. So we decided to take these observations a step farther and look into what's actually happening at each of these unique organ level and abnormality. So in order to do that, the first thing we did is with collaboration of John Port from Neuroradiology, we decided to do functional MRI and study the brain of patients who have these unique abnormalities. So using a, a functional MRI, we observe the hypothalamus, which is the area that controls our appetite and fullness sensation. And here we have uh, the T2 images of the hypothalamus, and we select the with these red dots or the blue where the hypothalamus is doing. And then we look at the blood flow on the hypothalamic area and in the patients without hungry brain or with hungry brain. So we use the white matter as our control, and then we have lean and obesity, and there's no difference in the blood flow in the white matter, neither if you have non-hungry brain or hungry brain, hungry brain will be blue. And then when we look at the hypothalamus on patients with lean and obesity, the areas that controls food intake, we just see noise. There's basically no difference between lean and obesity. But then when we separate these two groups of obesity, those without hungry brain in red and those with hungry brain that are consuming more calories, we can see that the blood flow in the hypothalamus, in the brain of these individuals, is lower compared to patients with obesity who do not have this phenotype. So it was a very interesting observation that when we reached maximal fullness on these patients, their blood flow has not actually changed as it changed on uh, patients with uh, non hungry gut. But it's interesting to see that 30 minutes later, when you are actually measuring satiety, both groups actually end up in the same place. We did the same thing with emotional hunger, but because we were looking at emotional hunger, we decided to look at other nucleus of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, which has been associated with reward, with depression, with anxiety, and food intake. So here we look at the nucleus accumbens, part of the limbic area, and we selected the area for those who are non-emotional eating, and emotion eating, and again, we look at blood flow, and you can see the difference in blood flow. Again, in the white matter, there was no difference between lean and obesity. 
And when we separate non-emotional hunger in red versus emotional hunger in the white matter, there's no significant differences. When we look at the left nucleus accumbens, there's no difference between lean and obesity. But when we separate these groups based on the emotional hunger profile or phenotype, we can see that patients with emotional hunger have higher levels of, um, of blood flow in the nucleus accumbens compared to those who do not have uh, emotional hunger. So it's an interesting observation. It's contrary to what we found on the hypothalamus on patients with emotional hunger, with, with hungry brain who have lower levels of emotional hunger. Same thing in the gut. When we look at the gut and patients with, uh, the, um, with uh, abnormal satiety, we look at gas, uh, GLP-1 and peptide YY, two hormones that are associated with satiety. There's no difference in lean versus obesity. But when we separate those patients with non-hungry gut versus those with hungry gut, these patients have very low levels of both GLP-1 and PYY. And furthermore, we, like to, we, we decided to look at mRNA expression in the gut, and we see that there was no difference in GCG, which is the gene that encodes for GLP-1, as well as for PYY. To our surprise, PYY was higher in obesity. But when we look at patients without hungry gut in red, the patients with hungry gut have lower levels of, of, of um, GCG as well as lower levels of PYY, suggesting that the gut is the one that is not making enough of these hormones to go to the brain and tell the brain, hey, you need to stay, continue to feel full and slow down the gastric emptying so I have time for digest. And then when we look at the slow burn uh, folks, these folks are, are less physically active and those who are doing physical activity exercise less minutes compared to those who exercise, all patients with obesity. Interesting, they also have less fat-free mass, so lean mass is lower in these patients, despite of having exactly the same weight and BMI. And when we look at metabolism, uh, and, and, and we use uh, this metabolite called alpha-aminodipidic acid, which is an amino acid that is telling us about muscle physiology and muscle activity, is significantly lower in patients with a slow burn. So what I want to show here is that these patients where we use an arbitrary uh, a priori defined cutoff, have a unique phenotype that is might be explaining the unique pathophysiology of obesity. And many of you were saying, well, that's great, but how is that going to help my patient in the clinic? So because of that, and very focused with the Mayo values, we decided how can we help our patients with these phenotypes? So we decided to start looking at if phenotype guided weight loss will be something we can use. So we decided to try to find out whether these phenotypes can be used as a companion diagnosis and help us tailor treatment for obesity. And in order to do that, we have actually published significant amount of trials that I would be inviting you to, to read. But basically we, we think that obesity phenotypes may predict the response to obesity pharmacotherapy and endoscopic devices. And uh, we have done many of these in single center randomized parallel group double blinded placebo control trials. And the first one we published was with fentamine to pyramate in 2015. Then we published with exenatide, liraglutide three milligrams, with the intragastric balloon, with endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, with aspire assist, and with the spats intragastric balloon. And all these trials have been published and, and, and are available for reading. But based on all these uh, preliminary studies, we decided to come with a working hypothesis. And the working hypothesis is that if you have a hungry brain, we should provide a unique hungry brain diet a unique medication, in this case, fentamine to pyramate. The device will be the V-block or the endoscopic sleeve, and the surgical approach should be the endoscopic, the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. For hungry gut, we should do a hungry gut diet. The medication should be a GLP-1 analog or a liraglutide, in this case, approved for obesity. Uh, the device should be intragastric balloons or intragastric gels, and surgery should be run wide gastric bypass. For emotional hunger, we should do focus on behavioral therapy and a hungry feelings diet and the medication should be propoplanol and trexon. I don't think there's a device or a surgery that will treat your emotional hunger. And for a slow burn, we should do an intense exercise plan with a slow burn metabolism and uh, fentamine more than as an appetite suppressor, we can use it as a stimulant to help with, with this patient with slow burn. And again, no device or surgery might help these patients. So we decided to bring these working hypotheses to a pragmatic clinical trial. And this just got published in obesity, and I'm sure it's a small font, but I need to fit all in one page. But basically, in summary, we actually invited uh, about 400 patients to participate. And we, and 200 of them, in a pragmatic fashion, went and received a standard of care medications. And then 100 patients of them actually received medications based on the working hypothesis that I just described before, uh, with the a priori cutoffs that we, I, I explained previously.
So here's the results of our pragmatic trial, and this just came out, so I'm excited to share. We have 84 patients who uh, were uh, assigned to a medication in the, guided, in the phenotype guided group against 228 patients. There was a significant difference in age. The phenotype guided group was significantly younger, and they were also significantly healthier with less comorbidities. And the use of medication was significantly different as what is expected, as the phenotype guided group the selection of the medication was based on a physician-patient's interaction and decision-making, while in the phenotype guided group, it was mainly driven by their phenotypes in an a priori defined cutoff. But here are our results. When we look at the phenotype guided group, um, uh, I have the percentage of patients who are losing more than 5% is 94% versus 73%. It is at 12 months. 10% total body weight loss is 79% versus 35%. 15% total body weight loss is 42% versus 18%, and 20% total body weight loss is 37% versus 1%. So taking into account that these 42% and these 37% of patients here who lost significant amount of weight are losing amount, the same amount of weight at almost bariatric surgery. And when we look at all comers and we look at the total body weight loss in one year in this pragmatic trial, patients who receive a phenotype-guided approach lost 16% of total body weight loss compared to 9% those who receive the medications, but receive it more in standard of care fashion. And nothing wrong with these 9%. This is very consistent with the trials. I just think that when you select the medications on a phenotype approach, you may actually improve their outcome. And of course, there's other things that may vary, such as number of visits with physicians, visits with dietitians, or visits with behavioral therapists, and there was no difference. There was also no difference on um, adverse events. Of course, this trial in a pragmatic fashion has many biases. The one group got a phenotype, and then their selection was told it was going to be based on their phenotype, and the other group didn't, was not told this. But it's interesting that this was also externally validated in a cohort uh, who got um, um, uh, intragastric balloons, and this was done in Madrid, Spain, by Dorcudor Godron Lopez Nava in the San Chinaro Hospital. So he decided to use our same approach and in collaboration with us. He studied 32 patients and provided them an intragastric balloon. The first thing he noticed is that those patients who are in slow gastric emptying or, or, or slow satiety, they are actually the ones who are most likely to fail to the balloon and have intolerance to the balloon, five times higher likelihood. But when we look at the response, those patients who have a accelerated gastric emptying, or we call hungry gut, they lost 17% of total body weight loss in six months compared to 9% those who do not have hungry gut. And then when we look at the responder rate, we see that patients with hungry gut, 79% of them will lose more than 10% compared to 20% in the non hungry gut group. So this was a very excited external validation showing that these a priori cutoffs of phenotypes that can be measured clinically actually enhance the weight loss and help us identify who are the best responders for this treatment. But of course, as you might, might be thinking, this sounds great, but not everyone can come to Mayo Clinic to be phenotype or have all these elaborated tests. So there has to be a more simple way. And working at Mayo, we're working on this biomarker discovery test in which we're trying to find out a way to, to have a blood test that is fasting and simple in order to identify these obesity phenotypes. So what we have done is we study a total of uh, 300 patients, 180 on the training cohort, 120 on the validation cohort, and we measure candidate genes, so genes that has been associated with these previous phenotypes. We measure targeted metabolomics, and we measure GI satiety hormones. Then we did a multiple logistic regression analysis, which included at the end one behavioral questionnaire, three SNPs, and six metabolites. And this actually told us that the test can predict the phenotypes with 91% accuracy on ROC and in the training cohort and 0.86 on the validation cohort. And then this uh, test was put through further statistical training called bootstrapping and the test predicted. When we look at the individual phenotypes, all of the phenotypes can be predicted with this um, um, algorithm with at least 90% accuracy, as you can see here in these ROC curves showing sensitivity and specificity. So we hope that in the future, this requires further studies and validation, the phenotypes can be measured with a simple fasting blood test that can be measured by uh, genetics, metabolomics, and hormones. And based on these, with a pattern algorithm that now we have a spin out with uh, Mayo uh, to this company called Phenomic Sciences, we will be able to identify these uh, obesity phenotypes. And based on the obesity phenotypes, I hope that physicians can have more tools to help them identify what is the best treatment choice 
for our patients. So in uh, summary, what I have shown today is that I think if we uh, think about precision medicine for obesity, we need to break obesity into pathophysiological phenotypes called hungry brain, hungry gut, emotional hunger, and slow burn. Each of these unique phenotypes has a unique pathophysiological abnormality that might be able to be identified with a multiomics test, and then it might help us drive um, um, treatment choices to have better outcomes. And then just to finalize, uh, and I know I went fast, but uh, I wanna just finalize the key takeaway points is that just want you to remember that the one treatment fits all is not working and it's not working for all. Obesity is a complex disease with many different phenotypes and phenotype guided intervention doubles the amount of weight loss. And this is published in uh, not only uh, randomized placebo controlled trials, but in the most recent pragmatic trials, both here at Mayo, as well as in Madrid, in Spain. And that obesity phenotypes uh, can be measured with a simple blood test that I hope in the future will be available for all to treat. So as I, you can imagine, uh, the amount of work that I've shown today uh, it requires a whole uh, team to deliver this. So I want to start by mentioning uh, my mentor and, and colleague, uh, Michael Camilleri, which we start working together on the phenotypes for obesity. All the members of my lab who are working uh, tirelessly to uh, try to understand and identify uh, the best phenotypes to help patients lose weight and keep their weight off. Uh, my other mentor, Dr. Nicolas LaRusso, all the funding sources, our collaborations within GI, particularly interesting and thankful for the collaboration with GIM with Don Hensrud and Healthy Living, in which we are validating uh, what we're calling the, the uh, a phenotype diet um, using a modified Mayo Clinic diet experience. And we think uh, by the end of the year, we'll have some uh, so some new data, whether a particular diet will work best for each phenotypes. And then in radiology, as I mentioned, John Port, in psychology, Mark Clark, who is mainly doing all the emotional hunger and driving uh, the care in, um, in, in those patients. Endocrinology, uh, the metabolomic score, the health science research, particularly Genetic El Paso, who's helping us with the, uh, uh, the stats for the biomarker study and the machine learning that is behind that. Uh, and then our external collaboration and our industry support. So thank you so much for your time. And I know I went fast, but I'll be delighted to uh, take questions and um, and um, make this give enough time for our discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Such an exciting area of research. I was just wondering, you know, now if we do have patients. Uh, you know, who'd be interested in knowing their phenotype? Is there a way to um, do any testing here at Mayo now, or, or uh, refer them to a study? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and I think um, it's um, it's uh, it's the great thing about all these things that we are measuring. Uh, if you think about this, Karina, um, resting energy expenditure, body composition using DEXA, gastric emptying, the buffet meal, and the questionnaires, all of them are clinically available tests. I didn't put them on Epic. They were on Epic before me. So uh, not that I've been pushing for this to be available. And we're just using these clinically available and validated tests to help us select the best intervention for our patients with obesity. So they are available. If you guys want to you know, order them, you can. But at the same time, if you want to refer patients to this particular phenotype approach, um, I'm, uh, you can refer them to uh, my clinic and I can, I'll be happy to see them and uh, do a phenotype approach. And this is in collaboration with the Health and Living Program uh, that we will be seeing these patients and providing um, the best care for patients with obesity. Uh, we have a question here. Do you do virtual visits? Uh, we do. Um, um, yes, we're do now doing, like everyone else, doing virtual visits. Uh, sometimes it's, the virtual visit is very limited if we need to order a test. But uh, this is a good place for patients to start. And I've had a few patients who uh, we have done a virtual initial consultation, relatively short visits, 20, 30 minutes, to explain what the uh, phenotype approach uh, entails, what are our outcomes. And then the patients have decided to come to me and spend a couple of days with us doing their, their tests. Another question here, I don't know if you can see it. It says, um, can people with normal weight have any of these obesity phenotype biomarkers? Now, that's a great question, and, um, and, and there's a constant conversation about that. At the end of the day, uh, we all humans, we, um, we have 
a significant amount of pathways that are developed to preserve calories. So we all have a predisposition for obesity. And the reason why this is because for uh, from since we were uh, created or evolved, however we want to decide we believe on, um, we have been living under starvation conditions. So we have been developing these tools within our body or these pathways to try to preserve energy and save calories. So we all have a predisposition to weight gain and to save calories. And I like to, to quote that for every hundred pathways that we have to save calories and gain weight, we have one to burn it. So the odds are against us, but that's because we have never lived in the abundance of nutrients and the sedentary sedentarism that we live to in this modern world. So with that said, all of us have a predisposition to weight gain. And I, what I'm looking right now, we're looking and starting to study these in patients who are overweight, defined by BMI, is that they also have a very unique phenotype. And when you start talking even with people who are normal weight, it's very interesting that you can say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm one of those who might think uh, emotional eating, or I'm one of those who, you know, can eat like the whole pie of the pizza before I feel full, or I just feel hungry all the time, or my metabolism is be abnormal. So I'm thinking that we all have this predisposition, and this is my hypothesis, and it's just going to take, if you just start taking the wrong decisions, or you're affected by different things in life, that you're going to develop that obesity phenotype. Great question. Um, and Dr. Gojas asks, is that the reason we gain, you know, gain weight later in life, or is it because of less exercise? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting. So we have a couple of studies that we follow folks who have an accelerated gastric emptying, and that's studies we have done, but there's also studies who have followed patients who have an abnormal satiation, so they just consume a lot of calories. And when you follow this, either in our studies or in other studies, when you follow these patients through time, those with the most severe phenotypes gain more weight than those who do not. So that may explain to you the pathophysiology. Uh, and to be very specific, those who have the most rapid gastric emptying when their 20s gain more weight than those who do not, despite of being at the same conditions. Now, of course, we're not adjusting, you know, we're not putting these individuals in a lab and study them for a decade, right? So this is in all commerce conditions. So they can be a lot of confounding uh, variables. But I do think that this is, uh, that the phenotypes may be driving our obesity. Now, later in life is a great question. And one of our colleagues, um, uh, Maria Daniela Hurtado, uh, she's an endocrinologist who is working between here and La Crosse. Uh, she's working with me trying to address whether the phenotypes change after andropause and menopause. Because of you know, as you all know, um, and that's an interesting conversation we're having with the, with the Women's Center, menopause is one of the most important triggers for weight gain in women, right? And it's common that we hear on our patients saying, um, you know, I was, I, I was able to keep my weight until menopause and then in menopause, I you know, skyrocket up. So what's happening there? It's just purely energy expenditure? Is it menopause and changes in hormones driving one of these other phenotypes? If so, which one and how we treat it, right? But those questions need to be asked. In men, it's interesting because we also go through andropause, and I think muscle mass might be driving many of these things, but men tend to gain weight a little bit sooner than andropause. So it's great questions, and I, uh, it's, it's definitely areas that we need to understand more. Yeah, so interesting. Um, another question, are, are there any single gene mutations that are associated with obesity? Yes, many, 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 many. Uh, so when we talk about genetics and obesity, we'd like to separate them in two parts. The monogenic syndromic obesity. So these are the kids like uh, Prader-Willis syndrome that you might have, uh, you might have seen in the PIDS rotation. And, and many of you, many of those are maybe either growing to be adults and dying care by many of you. Uh, so those are unique monogenic syndromic mutations. But we also have common non-syndromic genetic mutations in obesity. Uh, and um, there's, there's about, um, the largest study that's done right now is unpublished, but it's about 700,000 patients and have identified around 280 mutations associated with common obesity. Uh, and, and these common mutations are interesting because um, the FDH has approved a medication for three of them to target common genetic mutations of obesity. 
as well as syndromic obesity, of course. And, um, and we're going to be hearing more about genetic mutations in obesity. Additionally, and a little bit outside of the question, but I think important for us to know, Every week there's a new company selling some sort of DNA diet test or a DNA program saying, oh, let me get your DNA and I'll tell you which diet you need to eat. Well, that's super interesting and very promising. Most of the studies have shown that there's really no benefit on these DNA diet programs. I hope that in the future we'll have better guidance on DNA diets, but right now it's too early. Another question here. So why has obesity increased so much in the last 60 years if most of these phenotypes with the exception of decreased calorie burn have not changed? Yeah, woof, that's a tough one. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost like we like to explain as a double heat phenomenon. So we humans, we have the predisposition to weight gain and saving calories, and we are saving through many mechanisms. At the same time, um, we need to understand why certain people have these abnormal phenotypes or pathophysiological abnormalities. It could be a genetic predisposition that drove us to not have the sensation of fullness, as we are talking about genetics before. But there's, for example, other things, for example, an adenovirus infection, adenovirus 36, who have been associated with obesity. So how exactly is that viral infection, now that we're talking a lot about viruses, contributing to obesity, right? Is it through a phenotype or is it something else? We also have changed our food practices. The food that we're eating now is not the food we eating 60 years ago. We also have changed our consumption of liquid calories. And many of you might think is they're healthy, but we really don't know is non-artificial sweeteners, right? So all these changes in our food consumption I think are driving this obesity epidemic. The way that we grow food is different. The way that we eat food is different. The amount of food that we eat is higher. So we are living in a world of abundance on many things that we don't know. So I think the etiologies of obesity are, are many, and those are pairing with our pathophysiology and resulting in obesity. Uh, one last question from Dr. Boder here. Um, as our country becomes more obese as a whole, are we as physicians doing a good job of identifying who would benefit from this? Or is there a normalization of abnormal? Um, you know, I guess what percentage of patients do we identify and refer in GIM? Is there a way that Epic could help? Yeah, um, so, so yeah, the, the, the numbers are alarming. Uh, so 50% obesity in the next decade, uh, 80% of people will be normal, overweight or obesity. One billion people in the world. A study of their study shows that us physicians do a poor job dealing with the problem. And I like to say to, to, to physicians and to patients that we're super good at managing diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obstructive sleep apnea, NASH, depression, anxiety, joint pains, and blah, blah, blah. And I can just go in around in a circle and we keep ignoring what's in the middle, which is obesity. And then it's easier for us to talk about 10 medications to manage all of these comorbidities. And we are scared about prescribing a medication that's been approved for obesity for more than 60 years, which is fentanyl. So we feel comfortable treating ADHD with Adderall than using fentanyl for obesity. I think there's still a lot of education that needs to be done. Many of us still think that obesity is a lifestyle disorder and we don't recognize that patients are trying and failing. Because if you go out there and found a patient who has obesity, who hasn't tried to lose weight, that would be the first patient I've heard about that. Every patient who is overweight or with obesity has trial and fail. And on average, patients try five times. So when they come to see us, and we don't acknowledge that as the most important problem, and we acknowledge everything around it, I think we are not doing a fair job to our patients and we're ignoring the problem. I even want to say, and it's insulting to say this, we're ignoring the elephant in the room. And I know it's insulting because we're talking about obesity, but it is the most important problem that our patients are suffering with. So who cares about the diabetes and the hypertension and all these other things if we don't deal with the problem in the, in the middle? And we know that treating obesity treats everything else. So now we have better tools. And I think 
us as physicians and not only you know obesity experts or or those like myself who are American Board of Obesity certified I think every physician all the way from family docs internist through you know the neurosurgeons and the radiation oncologists everyone should be addressing obesity and particularly as we have the tools we have tests that we can order to try to help our patients understand why they have obesity we have FDA approved medications, we have endoscopic devices, and then there is surgery. None of them are perfect. None of them work for all. So we need to encourage the patient and start the discussion going. But I do wanna say that if you, those of you who wanna do talk about obesity to the patients or those of you who wanna start doing it, it's a very sensitive topic with your patients. So be careful when you start, you don't wanna get burned at the same time. So start by asking if it's okay to talk about their body weight. That will be my first, first, first advice for everyone. Hi, this is so helpful. This was a fantastic talk. Um, and a bunch of people saying great talk. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Please click the button below to complete the evaluation and obtain credit.